All right, it's about time to get started. Are you all ready? My name's Al Abbott. I'd like to uh, take this opportunity to welcome each of you guys here today to celebrate the life of my dad. Uh, on behalf of my mom, Bonnie, my brother, David, and our entire family, thank you for being here. The fact that you're here just shows how much you thought about my dad. Uh, a lot of you I've never met until today, but I've heard stories about each of you. I can't tell you the stories I've heard about you, but uh, my dad loved you guys. Uh, all you guys in the textile business, uh, you were his second family. So he definitely loved our family, and he definitely loved your family. So we just like to take this opportunity to welcome each of you here. Before we get started, there's a couple of people that I'd like to thank. First of all, I'd like to thank the staff here at the Embassy Suites. I hope all you guys got enough to eat. Uh, we got enough food to feed a small army, so feel free to please go back and eat more. And I know my dad would want you all to have the dessert section, so if you haven't tried that, it's over to my left, so make sure you do that. I'd also like to thank Devin Steele, who's right here in the front, blinding me with his pictures. But Devin helped set this up, uh, along with Lillian Link at the STA. Uh, she was primarily responsible for securing this and getting the invitations out, and we could not have done this without her and Devin uh, and, and the support of the STA. So I'd like to thank them especially. Also, I'd like to thank my cousin Cheryl Gotches. Cheryl helped set up the program. She did the video tribute that we're going to see in a few minutes. Um, could not have done it without her. And uh, just wanted to say thank you to all of you guys. Can we all clap? You can all clap. I'd like to tell you and go through the order of our program today. Uh, we're going to start off with a prayer. It's going to be led by Ernie Thigpen. Ernie is the minister at the Central Church of Christ in Spartanburg. That's my mom's home congregation. Uh, if you haven't met Ernie, please do. He's a great guy. He's a Clemson fan, so nobody's perfect. <laughs> After that, we're going to watch a memorial on my dad. Like I mentioned, Cheryl put that together. Uh, it's a lot of pictures, a lot of memories. We went through 50 years of pictures and culled it down to a few. Uh, it's going to be a little bit of a tearjerker for some of us, but we hope that we can show some of what dad meant to us. After we do that, my uh, aunt Lynn, dad's sister, is going to say a few words. I'm going to spend too much time talking. Uh, then after we do those things, we're going to have Rick Carpenter from the STA and Norman Chapman from Inman Mills say a few words about dad's impact on the uh, textile industry. Then it's your turn. After that, we're going to open the floor up. We'll have some microphones out. If there's anything you'd like to say, any stories you'd like to tell, our family would love to hear it. We don't know everything that happened in 30 years. We don't need to know everything that happened in 30 years. But the things that are appropriate for us to hear, we would like to hear. So please don't be shy and don't think you're under a time limit. We've got five hours blocked out, so as much time as you want to take. Uh, when we finish that, Big George's granddaughter, Autumn, is going to do a tribute. And then my brother, David, is going to wrap it up with some closing remarks. And uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ernie. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the joy of people we know. We thank you for the joy of people we meet, and we thank you for the joy of someone like George that connects all these people and so many more together. Uh, for the food that we've had, we give you thanks. Uh, for the conversations, for the thoughts, the memories that are present, a present reality among us, we give you thanks. For the words that will be said, we give you thanks. We do pray that, Father, you will be the God of all comfort and consolation. And may these 
these precious gifts of these precious memories, these stories shared, these images, begin to do the job that only memory can do through your work, and that's healing the wounds when someone so dear is lost. So be with Bonnie, be with sons, grandsons, all these friends. And we thank you for how special George Abbott makes this night. And only one can make it more special, and that's Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hello. Is this on? It's on. We got you. Okay. Very good. Well, I'm Cheryl Gotchis, and I was one of George's nieces, and I'm so excited to be here with you and really wanted to just start by saying thank you to so many who sent pictures. Uh, the one who's taking the picture right now is actually one of the big contributors to the program, so thank you, Devin. And so many families sent in pictures, and it's just wonderful. I think by having those pictures, you're going to see that they're just pictures from really throughout George's life. You know, they say a picture is worth a thousand words, and so my hope is when you see the pictures and images of him together, <coughs> It'll be like reading your favorite book or your favorite story where the main character is someone who is well-loved and has a life that is well-lived. As we look through things, we kind of have some chapters to the video that they're broken into sections. And really, I'll tell you, as I looked at it, I was amazed at how many roles that George had. And some I did not know. For example, I did not know he was called Mr. STA, really, until <laughs> recently. I did not know that. And so that was a role. There are certain things that he had because of his title or position. Most of the roles that I knew him by were through relationship and family. I feel like I had a front row seat to him in, in a lot of different ways, but it was primarily through family relationships. Uh, seeing him be a dad, seeing him be a son, and a, a really just a wonderful family member. Two roles in particular, though, I did have a front row seat to, and I want to just share a little bit about that really quick. One, I saw him be a big brother to my mom. He was a great big brother to her from the day she was born all the days of his life. We've talked a lot lately, you know, he was really her first friend, and throughout her life he was one of her best friends. And you know, that big brother piece didn't end when he left the house, or when they left and, and grew up at all. What happened was he just became more of a big brother. There was an example, you're going to see on some of the videos, there's something called the Cousins Beach Trip. And the Cousins, by the way, many of them are over on that side of the room. And they'd have this great beach trip every year. Well, there was one year where my, at the end, my dad had a medical situation. It was actually pretty serious uh, at the time and we didn't, it was very confusing. My sister and I were in Texas. And so we were trying to figure out how to best help my mom. And I remember calling her and saying, let's just fly out now we want to fly out and she said listen don't George is here and George is taking care of everything and all of a sudden I was like that's right he's 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 doing that and we didn't come because George took care of everything now the real front row seat I had to him was he was my uncle and so as a niece so Cindy and I were the nieces on the Abbott side and I want to tell you something. I think that this room will appreciate this a lot. If you were George Abbott's niece, this is one thing that you knew. You were always going to have the best sheets for your bed. Of <laughs> the best sheets. <laughs> and we had, we had sheets with the Care Bears. Cindy had strawberry shortcake when no one could get strawberry shortcake sheets. We had Star Wars. Even one of my friends one day, she was over, and I think she was spending the night, we had pulled the blanket back, and she kind of put her hands down. We were like in sixth grade, so it, and she put her hands, and she goes, 
these are great sheets, like really nice sheets. I was like, my uncle made those uh, sheets, yeah. And so we just loved it. We, we thought it was the greatest thing. I thought every niece had great sheets from their uncle, but no, it turns out it's not like that at all. But more importantly than that, George with us, just like he was with all of you, he always figured out a way to bring out the best in us, and he always saw the best in us. And that really was the greatest gift. And so I hope you enjoy this uh, look at George. You may need to talk amongst yourselves while I'm getting the video set up. So um, it'll be starting shortly, okay? she's doing that. I just want to say that uh, the golf balls in the center of the table are not just for decoration, but it, there's one for each of you. Yeah. If you haven't seen it already, it's Mr. Terrific. <laughs> Hi, I'm Lynn Abbott Segura, and George was my big brother. As I look out at you tonight, I've enjoyed meeting some of you. Some of you I've known for a very long time, my cousins and nephews and all over there. But one thing I know for sure, George was special to every one of us. He was indeed a special big brother. George and I lived on a farm. And how many of you have ever lived on a farm? Hmm, not too many people really know about farm living, do they? Um, it wasn't a big farm, but it was it's a nice sized farm. And uh, we learn, uh, first of all, on a farm you, you all work, you all have fun together. And since George was a little bit older than me, um, he was always the one who was the protector. He was also the one who called the shots most of the time. And when we uh, would play outside, we always played cowboys. I didn't have a cowgirl suit, I had a cowboy suit. And we would play cowboys hours upon hours. And then on Saturday, as we got older, we get to go to the movie. And what kind of movies did we watch? We saw cowboy movies. We saw Ward Rogers and Gene Audrey and Hopalong Cassidy. And sometimes they even had cowboys there. So that was very exciting for us. Another thing that we played was baseball. We had a big yard out front and we played baseball. Well, it was only two of us because we, you know, even though we had neighbors, they weren't the neighbors that lived, you know, right across the street or next door. So we played baseball together, and I thought it was really odd that he always hit the ball, and I ran after the ball. <laughs> <laughs> what is this? Is it that I learned to be a good pitcher, but, and I also got a lot of exercise. Maybe I should do that now, right? But finally I would say, why don't I get to hit the ball? He said, you're not ready yet. <laughs> I never really got ready because in a few years he was bringing other friends in and I was still running after the ball. We also rode our bikes a lot. My parents had us nice bikes, and, but we had to be very careful not to go near the road because there was a curve not too far down and my parents, of course, were very afraid that we would um, be there at the wrong time, shall we say. Uh, and then, if they did find us riding our bikes in the road, how many of you know what a cottonwood tree is? Big leaves, right? Yeah. Well, there was a cottonwood tree right outside the uh, kitchen window. If we were caught riding our bikes in the um, road, we had to rake the cottonwood leaves up. So we were very careful about not riding our bikes there. You know, growing up on the farm, it gave us a chance to really, to do things together as a family. And our parents were always, I think the best parents in the world. They taught us 
to love each other, to protect each other, and to just generally look out for each other. As we got older, we went to the same school, and I felt I was pretty lucky because my brother was really good looking, so all the girls liked him. So I got to be George's sister. Um, when we graduated, uh, he's ahead of me, and he went to college, and then I went to college, and we, thank goodness, we both graduated from college, and, but we would still go back to North Carolina. And the textile business at that time, they always took, they always closed the meals down the first week in July, somebody's nodding their head, they remember, and Christmas week, which worked out great for me. I was a teacher, so I could be there then. And so we would go back and, and we would share that time together as, as we had children. Uh, Al and David came first, and then my girls came along. And so it was fun. We, I, our grandkids uh, really grew up together. And I won't even begin to tell you some of the things that Al and David did to Cheryl especially, because she was so I mean, it would be so embarrassing right now. We don't even need to go there, right, guys? I get to speak to you. Yeah. <laughs> well, we, don't, we won't believe you. Okay. Uh, as we kept coming back and, and having fun together and our kids growing up together, uh, it was just a fun time and we loved that. And then we came to the point that there was no one at the home place, as they call them in North Carolina. They call it the home place. I'm not sure about South Carolina. But there was no one there. My parents had both passed away. And so we found that we had to be a little bit more creative about how we would be, see each other. Uh, we would work out. Sometimes we would be in North Carolina, sometimes in uh, at the beach with the, the beach cousins, but we still maintain that. And even though after we started working, George and I never lived in the same state at the same time, and sometimes we didn't even live in the same country. But because our parents had taught us to love each other, to care for each other, we maintain that relationship. And some of the things that I remember as we got older was how friendly. I would be out with George somewhere. Maybe it was in Spartanburg, out eating dinner. And people would speak to him. He was so friendly. It was like everybody knew him. And even after he was at the wedding of our two daughters, for weeks after that, people would say, I met your brother. Uh, boy, is he wonderful. And I'm thinking, okay, can you say something nice about me? You know, we, I'm, I'm okay too. But he, was, he just had that really magnetic personality. And his positive attitude. I was a school teacher and I heard a lot of negative from teachers. And so I thought I would listen to him and he would call me and he would tell me all this great stuff. And I said to some friends, People talk about the glass being half full and half empty. With George, the glass was running over all the time. That was just the way he was. And so you better believe if I started to say something negative when I was talking to him, I changed that real fast. Because I did not want him telling me that well, that's really a bad way to feel about that. So that was one of the uh, things that I'm still working on, always being positive. Our older grandson was in the house last week and I said, Drew, what is a word you can think to describe your Uncle George? He said, passionate. And I thought, yeah, that's good. He said, about sports. <laughs> <laughs> and and he, he was, he was very passionate about sports. I remember when he was very much younger. He loved the New York Yankees baseball. That was his favorite baseball team. I think probably because my grandfather, who we lived with in, in the house with, that was his favorite team. And then about the time he was in seventh or eighth grade, it became Duke basketball. He loved Duke basketball. 
Well, when you go to NC State, you got to change that. You can't be a Duke fan anymore. And so then he became a very avid NC State fan. And then I'm not sure what happened, but you know, he sort of started liking Alabama. But we were talking about that, right? <laughs> Uh, most of the time, I felt George was a very humble person. Uh, he didn't uh, didn't share a lot about what he was doing, or I mean, he would talk about it, but he didn't say a whole lot about his part in it. Except one time, it didn't work that way. He was in Texas for the, uh, our older daughter's wedding, and the groomsmen had a golf tournament. Well, you got George, you got David, you got Al, and Al's friend. They won. <laughs> they, meaning mainly George, at the rehearsal dinner that night, were obnoxious. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was unbelievable. And I'm looking at him like, what happened to the humble person? What happened to this person I'd known all my life as being humble? Well, just put him on the golf course. I decided that changes at all. <laughs> in the past few years, uh, George had been out to visit us. With, uh, he came a couple of times with David. And I found he was very flexible. One time he was there, they came in. Well, first of all, he came in and I said, we're having brisket for dinner. And he said, I don't eat red meat. And I said, you're in Texas, sorry. You, know, you have to eat red meat. That's what we have. But that night, we had eaten dinner and it was sort of a messy night, and it's the kind of night that you don't want to go out. I said, George, um, Jacob, our second grandson, is playing um, JV football tonight. And he looked at me like, okay. And I said, we're going. Well, okay, we're going. So we grabbed our umbrellas and we all went to see Jacob play JV football. And George was the first one to congratulate him when he walked off the field. Well, then the next day I said, hey, by the way, I know it's 96 degrees, but at 5 o'clock we're going to see Baylor play football because our older grandson is running the Baylor line. Do any of you know what the Baylor line is? Baylor line is when all the freshmen at Baylor have a chance before the players come out to run out before the players. It, it is really a fantastic, matter of fact, George said to me that night, I've never seen anything like this. But it was so many of those freshmen that night, we don't know if we saw Drew or not, but George was there to see him. All my life, I have known that I could count on George. And I stand here the night and think about him, I feel the biggest void in my life. And I'm so glad that I do have other people you know how I feel. And he was a terrific big brother. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. So I want to start with, uh, real quick, with Cheryl again. Thank you. Uh, I don't think Cheryl wants me to tell this, but I'm going to tell it anyway. Because <laughs> I got the microphone and you don't. Uh, so Cheryl is uh, Vice President of Human Resources at Baylor University. And as we were going through this, David and I couldn't think of a better person to help set this up than Cheryl. This is what she does. She's a natural, as you all know this. So she, we put her in touch with Lillian and Devin with the SDA. And they're going back and forth, emails, text messages. And I'm talking to Cheryl as this thing's getting close to being put together. And I said, well, where are we? And she said, we just got one little problem. And I said, okay, what's that? She said, my staff thinks I'm leaving. I'm like, but you're leaving? What are you talking about? Well, they come in and ask me if I'm going into the textile business in South Carolina because I've devoted all my time and energy to all these textile people. So all you guys, you're trying to hire my, my, my cousin. So. <laughs> I want to uh, pick up with a couple of things, some stories, hopefully, that will shed some light on what Dad meant to us. Uh, first of all, to piggyback what Lynn said, sports was important to him. It's super important to me. It's super important to David. And that's one of the three main factors uh, that 
David and I both connected with my dad. As uh, Lynn said, dad grew up a Yankees fan. She told you why. But dad's favorite fan, we're all of a certain age, most of us, right? Dad's favorite baseball player wore number seven, and it's Mickey Mantle. Mm -hmm. So all of you of an age are like, yeah, Mickey Mantle. So Mickey Mantle comes to Columbus, Georgia for an autograph session. So my dad gets to meet his childhood hero, Mickey Mantle, and I get to go with him. I mean, this is, this is great. All of you guys that are out there know what I'm talking about. So we go to see Mickey Mantle. We stand in line forever. We come up. I'm so excited. It's Mickey Mantle. It's my dad. He introduces himself, signs a baseball, and dad walks off. I'm like, wait, wait, wait. That's Mickey Mantle. And this is the only time I ever saw my dad totally speechless. <laughs> Did not know what to say. We walk off. I'm like, dad, that's Mickey Mantle. Didn't say a word. I finally get in the car, and he looked at me, and he said, Al, that's Mickey Mantle. <laughs> But as David and I play baseball, football, basketball, we always try to wear number seven. If seven wasn't available, 17, some number with a seven to honor my dad, to honor Mickey Mantle. So as Tucker came along and played football and baseball, and I coached him, for some reason, Tucker always wore number seven. And so I don't even know if you know that's why you always wore seven, but you always wore seven to honor your grandfather. So that was his first love was baseball, the New York Yankees. He then, as Lynn said, went to state, graduated from state, and became a big North Carolina State fan. Go Wolfpack. So in 1974, North Carolina State had probably the best college basketball team I'd ever seen. I've watched a lot of basketball. But they had a great player named David Thompson. And you Carolina fans and Duke fans, I'm sorry, but David Thompson was the best in the ACC. So I can remember living in Macon, Georgia, and me and Dad in front of a television watching North Carolina State play the mighty UCLA Bruins, four or five time defending national champions in one of the best basketball games I ever saw. Double overtime and State beat UCLA. It was the greatest moment. Two nights later, they have to play Marquette for the national championship, which they did. My dad was so happy that North Carolina State won a national championship. Fast forward to 1983. You basketball fans already know where I'm going. I'm at the University of Alabama. State somehow makes it to the NCAA tournament. They're no good. They have a really good coach named Jim Valvano, but they're no good. They finally... You're no good. No, we were good. They, were, they're no good. <laughs> they finally somehow win the uh, ACC tournament. They have to beat Virginia and Ralph Sampson. They somehow do it. They make it to the tournament. They're losing every game in the tournament, and they win in the last second. It's unbelievable. They make it to the finals to play the Houston Cougars. Now, outside of that 1974 state team, I'd never seen a better team than the Houston Cougars. A lot, uh, Akeem Halajuan. Clyde the Gr Glide Drexler. So I'm at the University of Alabama. It's a Monday night. I'm watching the game. Big George is watching the game in Columbus. I call him at halftime. State's getting beat pretty bad. I said, Dad, it ain't going to happen. He said, this is a team of destiny. We will win. I'm like, yeah, right. <laughs> so <laughs> Houston totally tanks. State wins on the last play of the game. You all know, jumped up, dunked the ball at the end. State wins. So I called my dad, and all I could hear was him yelling, I told you, North Carolina State's going to win. <laughs> so he was always a Wolfpack fan. Now, that was 1983. He didn't have much to cheer for after that. So he had to find something else to cheer for, right? <laughs> so he became an Alabama football fan. So I got some more Eagle fans out here, and they're going to appreciate this story. And people have asked me, Al, how did your dad become an Alabama football fan? And how did... I become an Alabama football fan. So dad was working with Dan River Mills in uh, Danville, Virginia. It's 1966, and he gets transferred to Alabama, Selma, Alabama, 1966. So I'm a little tot. He ends up at the plant. One of the plant supervisors introduces himself first week. He said, George, who do you pull for? Kind of looked at him kind of strange. He said, football. 
Who do you pull for? Thought about it for a minute. He says, you know, I pull for North Carolina State. Guy looked at him, he laughed a little bit. George, you got two choices. It's either Alabama or Auburn. You come back next week and you tell me who you choose. <laughs> Fast forward a week later, guy ran into him. Now this is 1966, Bear Bryant, Joe Namath, Kenny Stabler, okay, it's Alabama. So dad says, I've chosen Alabama. The guy says, George, great choice. And so that's how he became an Alabama fan, and that's how I became an Alabama fan. And then I grew up watching Alabama. So my first main connection with dad was through Alabama football, because that's something that we shared. Now remember, we lived in this great state of Alabama in 1966. There's not a lot of good things going on, but we had that football team. So fast forward all these years later, we have Thanksgiving at my house every year. David and his family come up, dad and mom come down, but we have Thanksgiving. That is the week of the Alabama Auburn game, which is the big game to us. So we have Thanksgiving every year, and my wife Angie has us put on a card everything we're thankful for. So, you know, she's pretty serious about it. We aren't. Uh, but we put it on there, and then at the end of the meal, she reads what we wrote, and you have to guess who said it. So, you know, sometimes we wax philosophical. I generally don't. Mine is pretty easy. But every year when we finish, I looked at my dad and told him, thank you for choosing Alabama. Because that's what I grew up. Me and him went to football games from when I was a little tot all the way up. In the mid-70s, he took me to my first Alabama-Auburn game. And I'd never seen anything like this. I'm a little kid. I love Alabama. I love football. There's 40,000 Alabama fans at Legion Field. There's 40,000 Auburn fans. I don't know why. But they're all there. It's the passion and Alabama wins. And that was in the mid-70s. I have gone to every Alabama-Auburn game since then. And every time I do, I'm thankful to my dad for making that choice and to starting me on that road. So roll tide to Big George. So, so, so having graduated to Alabama from Alabama and given a lot of money to Alabama and being a season ticket holder to Alabama, I go to all the football games. So as I mentioned, dad took me to games. Well, as we got older, I had the opportunity to take dad to games. And so every year, I would take him to a game or two. And it was not a little game, it was a big game. So all my friends came to know him as Big Game George. If he showed up to a ball game, it was a big game. And I took him to numerous SEC championship games. We saw games all across the country. But me and him saw seven national championship games together. And those were just great times. We saw games Los Angeles, Dallas, Phoenix, Miami, Tuscaloosa, Birmingham, Athens, Auburn, Columbia, South Carolina. Yeah, I was there that day. Uh, New Orleans. Uh, we even went to Durham when Alabama played Duke. Blowout. But we, look, he even took me to Clemson. So I got to see him run down, tap the rock, and that was a North Carolina State game. But I think about all those games that we saw. So we tell that story, and all my friends know that story, and they understand why. Now you know why. Right? Yeah. Roll Tide, right? Now you know why. So uh, we're in the Alabama Alumni Association. The president is a good friend of mine. His name's Blair. And Blair calls me, and he says, this was 2018, Thanksgiving. Al, I've got a guy from the local newspaper. He wants to do an article about fans and their association with Alabama, and he called Blair. And Blair said, you don't need to talk to me, you need to talk to Al, he's got a story for you. So I told him that story about dad becoming an Alabama fan, how we do it at Thanksgiving. He wrote that in the newspaper. And the next day, the day of that game, I gave that article to my dad. And that just meant so much to me. So that was one connection we had was there. Now, as David and I grew up, we played ball. And we played ball all the time. And all you guys are in the textile business. Some of you have been in the textile business a long time. Most of you probably haven't been in it as long as Dad, 50-something years. But back then, Dad worked all the time. And he loved to work. 
Right? He loved his family, but he loved to work. There would be times when Dad would be gone before we got up, and we wouldn't see him and, and that night. Right? We just wouldn't go. But when David and I had a ball game to play, he was always there. And when I say we played ball, I mean we played ball. I played football, baseball, basketball. I played baseball all the way through college. David grew up, played baseball forever, played baseball all the way through college. And Dad did not miss our games. He made an effort to be there. And that showed us how important family was. Regardless of what he had going on, if me or David had a ball game, if it was all possible, he would be there. And I've tried to do that same thing with my family, and David has also. So in 1984, David's uh, a senior at Columbus High School. I played at Columbus High School. Our baseball team was average. A decision was made to hire a new coach for David's <coughs> senior year. And they decided to hire an up-and-coming <coughs> hotshot coach named Bobby Howard. And so Bobby came in and joined Columbus High School with the vision of making Columbus High School a state champion. So my dad just happened to be the president of the Booster Club. So dad and Bobby got to know each other and dad will tell the story that I told Bobby, Bobby, you coach the players, I'll do everything else. And he did. And Bobby would ask for something and dad would raise money. And dad would encourage him and that little baseball team won the state championship that year and have gone on and Bobby under his leadership have won several state championships. And Coach Howard is here with us today. And Bobby, I'd just like to personally thank you for what you mean to our family. So thank you, Bobby. <laughs> a final thing in the golf, in the sports world is golf. So Dad liked golf, he was no good at it, but he liked golf. <laughs> Uh, I was pretty good, not real good, and he ends up in Inman, and him and Rob Chapman become friends in the Chapman family, Norman and Mr. Chapman before that, and Rob and Dad hit it off, they play a lot of golf together, and next thing I know, Dad's calling me saying, hey, I'm going to play golf tomorrow, and I'm like, yeah, great, well, look, don't you want to know where, sure, uh, Augusta National, I'm like, wait, what, and so he went and played in Augusta National, thanks to Rob. And for you golfers, you know you have the legendary 11th hole, the par three. And so after they play, Dad calls me and I ask him how he did. He said, Al, I don't understand why 11 so hard. I just got up there and hit it right on the green. I'm like, did you really? He said, yeah. I said, how many shots did it take? And he said, that doesn't matter, Al. <laughs> so I'd, I'd like to thank the Chapman family for all they've meant to us uh, and to my dad. Uh, we were able to go to Augusta so many times. We've been behind the ropes. We've been uh, in the clubhouse. We've had dinner with the members. I've talked to the golfers, uh, and that's because of the Chapman family and allowing Dad and us to do it. Uh, just special times, but we were able to connect. And so one of the big ways that we all connected was through sports. Second way that we connected was through work. So, as you guys all know him from work, he's a pretty driven guy, right? You can't tell him no because he won't accept it. You can't tell him you can't do something because you can't. So, in 1986, we're in Columbus. He's working at the Bibb Mills, and his time with Bibb ends prematurely. Let's just put it that way. So, Dad was out of the textile business and vowed to me that he would never again work for another person that we were going into business together. Oh, that sounds like a pretty good deal. I'm 25 years old, graduated college, looking for something to do. Dad meets the owner of a new restaurant that had just opened in Valdosta, I mean in Columbus, Mr. J's Family Steakhouse. So Dad meets Mr. J, have a nice conversation. I, he comes home, Al, we're going in the restaurant business. I'm like, we are. Yeah, what are we gonna do? Mr. J's Steakhouse. Never heard of them. It's all right. We're going to be the first franchise. We are. Where are we going to do this? We're going to Valdosta, Georgia. I'm like, okay. Okay. And uh, how are we going to pay for this? Don't worry about it. Okay. So we're going to open a restaurant that we don't have any experience in. We're going to move to a city that I've never set foot in. 
and we're going to borrow a million dollars and we don't have any money? Okay. That's not going to happen. A year and a half later, we opened that restaurant. And the only way we opened it is because my dad would never take no for an answer. Whenever the bank turned us down, he just asked why. We solved that problem. When we couldn't do this, tell me why. We solved the problem. So that was Big George. Never took no. You can do anything you want to. So several of you have asked me, well, why do you call him Big George? He's not a big guy. Well, he was a big guy. He just wasn't tall in stature. But as we started that restaurant, I quickly realized that I was going to have to call him something other than dad. I mean, you know, that reeks of nepotism, right? So I, I'm not going to call him George. So I got to come up with something. So he was a big fan of the Godfather. And I'm thinking, okay, well, he's kind of like the Godfather. What am I going to call him? So I started calling him Big George. He didn't like that. He just didn't like it. He grew on it and eventually liked it. But I'll let you know that all my friends, they only know him as Big George. My family, they only know it. My wife only knows him as Big George. My kids, Big George. David's family. So all of you, he's George. To us, he's Big George. So that's kind of where that came from. The last thing I wanted to talk about that we connected was family. And family was important to Dad. He spent a lot of time with us. He worked so much when we were young, as I mentioned, but he, he took time for us. As he got older and his work leveled out a little bit, he was able to spend a little more time with us. But like Lynn said, every year we would go one week in the summer to our grandparents in North Carolina and around Christmas. And we learned what family was all about. It didn't matter if I was going to be on the all-star team. It didn't matter if we were going to, somebody was going skiing. We were going to be with our family. And we learned how important it was. And then as our kids came along, we kind of tried to instill that in it, uh, in, in us, in them. So most of you are going to know what I'm about to say. My mom and dad were strict, uh, perfectionist, good isn't enough. You've got to do the best. That's how David and I were raised. No slack. They're right and wrong. You all understand that, right? right? Then they became grandparents. <laughs> all the rules go off the table. My kids, not raised by them the way I was. David's, no. So I would watch my mom and dad take them places. They would do things that we never thought of doing. And my point of all that is Big George showed us how to love and how to do those things by the time he spent with us. And we went everywhere at that age. They did everything. And when Big George was with you and we went somewhere, as an example, you go to the beach. All right, well, we went to the beach. We got to go parasailing. We've got to ride go-karts. We've got to do whatever there is to do. When we go up here to visit, when I came up to visit them, the kids have to go to Tweets. We have to go to the mountains. We have to go to Chimney Rock. We have, to, we have to do all these things. We have to experience everything. So we learned to do all that. And to wrap it up, my dad was always so supportive of me and David and everything we did. He was our cheerleader. Now, he wouldn't lie to us, but he was a cheerleader. And whatever we did, he'd support us in. So as I opened my business, he supported me. When David opened his business, he supported him. He was always there for us. And I'll never forget that. So dad was supremely proud of us. I've talked to so many of you, and you've each come up to me and, and said, hey, which one are you? Are you the Alabama guy or are you the chicken guy? <laughs> I, I'm the Alabama guy, Dave's the chicken guy. And they would tell me things like, I know so much about you. I'm like, what do you know? Well, all you have to do is talk to George Abbott for a few minutes, and he's going to talk about his kids. So that meant a lot to us. I remember going to the Masters, and I'm there to watch the golf. I'm a Tiger Woods guy. And I'd go to watch Tiger or Phil or even Jack Nicholas, and I want to see the guys hit the ball. Right? Gooch can understand this. They know how to hit the ball. So I want to watch them hit the ball. It's important to me. So Dad and I would watch somebody play, and then he'd say, we got to go, son. Where we got to go? 
we're going to go over to the 12th hole and we're going to meet so-and-so. So we'd walk over, we'd meet so-and-so, they'd shake my hand and say, I know so much about you, Al. And that always struck me. And wherever we went, everybody knew my dad, everybody liked my dad, and everybody knew me and David. So, he always told us how much he was proud of us. The thing he told me he was most proud of me was the father that I had become. And he told me how proud he was and that I had been able to spend more time with my kids that he hadn't had that opportunity, but that he was so glad that I had done that. So that meant so much to me. But, you know, nobody's perfect, right? Everybody's got a fatal flaw, right? And my dad did too. So if you, if you will just humor me, by a show of hands, if you've ever ridden in a car with my dad, <laughs> look, the Lord is good because you're still here. Okay? I do not ride with my dad. Never ride with my dad. And for, for you guys that don't know, my dad thought he was Mario Andretti. He drove fast. I don't mean a little fast. I mean fast. He thought speed limits were a suggestion. So I don't know how many speeding tickets he got, but however many he got, he probably talked himself out of three times as many. Okay. So I want to tell you two stories. Uh, he always complained about South Carolina roads. Okay. He called me one time and he was, he was really mad. And I'm like, what, what you, what's wrong? And he's like, it's dang South Carolina, na 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 na. I'm talking to the South Carolina Department of Transportation. I'm like, what about? I hit a pothole. Okay. And it blew out a tire. I'm like, it happens, man. Yeah, but I blew out all four of them. <laughs> <laughs> what? 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 what kind of pothole do you hit to blow out four tires? <laughs> Dad, he said, well, maybe it wasn't a pothole. Maybe they done some construction and I didn't see it. Like, it makes a little more sense. And I'm like, what are you going to do about it? He said, I'm going to complain. And they paid for four new tires because he hit a construction zone. So the last story about the driving at Thanksgiving, the day after we had a local restaurant we always go to. It's a big group. So we go in multiple cars. I'm working. I'm going to meet them there. I get there and they're all busting out laughing when I'm there. I'm like, oh my God, what has happened now? And dad's laughing kind of sheepishly. And my son is busting out, my wife Angie. I'm like, all right, what happened? And so uh, I forget who it was, which one, but my dad had gotten a, a fancy new car. He liked his cars, had a fancy new car and it had the backup cameras. Now, all of our cars had backup cameras, but at this time, nobody's car had a backup camera. Big George had a backup camera. He was so proud of that. He showed us and he said, oh, Al, it's so great. You could never hit another car. You'd have to be the worst driver in the world to hit another car. <laughs> I'm like, well, here we are. So if I go to the restaurant and I get there, I'm like, what happened? And my wife and, and son Tucker tell me the story. And they said, so we're here. It's kind of a, par a tight parking spot. So Big George is pulling in and he's backing his car in. And the warning sound starts going off from the camera. Beep, beep. Beep, and they're like, uh, George, you hear the camera? Oh, it's okay, it's okay. Beep, 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 bam! <laughs> now remember, you got to be the worst driver in the world to hit a car <laughs> with a backup camera, right? So he hits the car, but that's not the funny part. He hits the car, and they're all stunned, and he says, oh, I don't want to park here. And they just drive <laughs> off. <laughs> so again, if you've ever ridden in a car with my dad, and you're here today, the Lord is looking out for you. <laughs> So in closing, I just want to say that my dad was the most optimistic person I know. Lynn is absolutely right. He's not a glass half full guy. He's a glass overflow, overflowing guy. And I've told several people this, and I'm going to say it to all of you. He had this unique ability to connect with everybody on a personal level very quickly. Genuinely. He did not fake it. He loved people. And he wanted to be involved. It's not a trait that I share. But he wanted to know you and everything about you. He didn't talk about himself very much. He, he didn't want to talk about him. He wanted to talk about you. He wanted to know what he could do for you. There aren't a lot of people like that, y'all. 
And when you have people like that, you're drawn to them. And all my friends were always drawn to my dad. So again, we go to all these games. These are my friends. I love these people. Hey, Al, is your dad here? <laughs> what about me? Okay, whatever. <laughs> but the last thing that Trey, that was so special with my dad, he had the innate ability to convince people that they could do anything they wanted to do. When we were growing up, David and I were told that we can be anybody we want to be, we can do anything we want to do, and we both believed it. And he told us the truth. And I'm so thankful for that. But he would not let you say no. He would not let you say, I can't do it. And he would genuinely be able to convince people to do the things that they were capable of doing. So we've lost a big presence. There's a void in our family. But my dad prepared me and David to take that man along. And so we're going to definitely follow in his footsteps and try to live up for the standard. So somebody asked me, they said, Al, if you had to describe your dad in one word, what would it be? And to borrow his phrase and to steal from it, Big George was terrific. Thank you. Now at this time, Dad's second family was his industry textiles. Rick Carpenter and Norman Chapman are going to share a few words. Um, this will probably encompass more of the last 30 years. So again, and thank you to them in advance. Thank you. Love this. Um, I'm not sure I'll ever forget it. I was driving home the day after George died and I saw his name pop up on the screen in my car. Expecting to hear George's voice on the other end of the phone, instead I heard, Norman, this is David Abbott. After hearing what he had to tell me, I sat there in disbelief. I said, I thought George would live forever. We all did. George never slowed down and fought age harder than anyone I've ever known. His attitude, zest for life, and energy never changed in all the new years that I knew him and worked with him. And thinking about standing here and making remarks, the first thing I did was pull his personnel file at Inman. Though his career spanned over 30 years at Inman, it was the thinnest file in the cabinet. George came to work on May 4, 1988 as Vice President of Manufacturing and retired on October 31st, 2018, a run of 30 and a half years at Inman in the same role. May 4, 1988 to October 31, 2018 time markers for a great career, but it is the dash between the dates that we're here to talk about. George worked with numerous plant managers, department heads, ship managers, hourly employees, and others, many are, who are here tonight, and I think he loved them all. As much as George loved the textile industry, and there is no denying that, he loved the people more. His positive attitude, enthusiasm, and energy were contagious. In his time as Vice President of Manufacturing, George oversaw 154,835,088 in capital expenditures in our company. He also saw record sales in 1998, then fall by 70% in 2001 as a result of the Asian financial crisis. This resulted in plant closings and layoffs. During the difficult years of the early 2000s, 
we saw employment reduction from 1,320 employees to just 440. Those were clearly the most difficult times for him and all of us at Inman. But this is when George was at his best. His positive attitude helped get us through it. His can-do spirit was necessary to completely transform Inman's customer base and product line. The old strategy of limited change, easy to make, was just no longer going to work. He rallied the troops and challenged everyone to embrace the change. Once he got everyone in manufacturing's buy-in, it became all about speed. Speed kills became the motto. Speed became a core competency at Inman, and we were good at it. Saying yes, even when I know George had no idea how we were going to do something, became the norm. George assured us that he and his team would figure it out. We went on to make many different products over the years, including 400,000 yards of wheat of denim at one point. For those of you who know textiles, Making that much denim in a gray mill with no contamination is no small feat. Several years later, we went on to break our record sales and had back over 300 jobs. If he had not had the ability to get people to follow, I would not be standing here today. We will always be grateful for that. Others will speak about George's involvement in STA or other industry involvement, but from Edmund Mill's point of view, George was the right person at the right time. Since part of the ask was to tell stories while I was up here, I'll leave you with two. And Al's already alluded to this, but if you never had the opportunity to ride in a car with George, <laughs> all I can say is it was a thrill. <laughs> Fast is not even close to describing how George drove. We went to see a customer one day, and on the way back, we were close to that area, Virginia, Tennessee, and North Carolina, where it all came together, and you pass through all three states in a very short distance. And there's no other way to describe it. We were hauling ass. <laughs> when the blue light showed up behind us, George pulled over, went straight to the glove box for the registration, and looked at me with a panicked look on his face. I've been pulled over many times with George, so I was a little surprised. What state are we in? <laughs> Oh, George, what difference does it make? He said, it matters. It really matters. <laughs> the second is about a customer visit. You never knew what you were going to get out of George when you took him to a customer, but he loved to go, and the customers loved him. This was shortly after we went into the knitting business, and we were working on, our customer was really focused on getting more stretch in the product. We've been working hard on this product and we've gotten it into a very good place. And um, so George came along and after the, we walked in with three very serious engineers in the room that didn't smile much. And we, um, after the meet and greet and all the friendly conversation, I took the, our new product out, put it on the table to start the conversation. Well, we hadn't even started talking and George reached over and grabbed the fabric and he looked at those guys and he said, y'all have heard a two-way stretch? You've probably heard a four-way stretch. We have 360 stretch. <laughs> All three of the engineers just busted out loud. <laughs> and we were walking out of the, the customer after that meeting. I said, George, 360 stretch? Really? And he said, that was good, wasn't it? <laughs> he 
said, if I didn't love manufacturing so much, I'd go into sales. <laughs> On behalf of the many associates of Inman Mills who had the pleasure of working with George for over 30 years at Inman, I offer the family our sincerest condolences and thanks for the many years he put his heart and soul into our company. God bless your family and God bless George's life and all that he meant to all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, I'm Rick Carpenter, the president of the STA, which kind of saw a lot of pictures and things, and it's just been a wonderful pleasure to get to know George's family. Uh, we, we always hear about you. One of the last times I talked to George before I saw him in December, I caught him one day and I said, what are you doing? He said, man, I'm cleaning up chicken in Zaxby's, man. I'm, I'm working. And, and I felt good. But, you know, we heard about you, but it's, it's been a wonderful pleasure getting to know all of y'all tonight. Um, it's quite an honor to be, be speaking here tonight. And uh, I started to write a speech. Then I thought, <clears throat> I knew how George hated speaking in public. And you would never, unless you knew George, because George was just Mr. Everybody to everybody. But if he had to speak in an SDA event, Devin would write his speeches. He would practice, you know, the night before. And I said, oh, if I wrote a speech tonight, George would be very disappointed in me. Um, Lynn, you said George was passionate about sports. George was passionate about life, and he shared that with our organization. Um, and I'd like for everyone that's with STA or has been in STA and family that's here tonight, would you please stand? I think that shows you know, what, what that means to us. Now, while you're seated, how many of you in this room tonight, did George get into STA or into leadership in STA? He was Mr. STA to us. Uh, me personally, I joined STA in 2000, uh, just kind of a rookie member and George was president. I get this call one day, George wasn't in my cell phone yet. And uh, he said, Rick, this is George Abbott. And I said, well, hey, Mr. Abbott. He said, this is George. <laughs> and I said, okay. And he said, um, I need you to serve on this task force. And I said, okay. We're, go we're going to kind of look at SDA. And it was during those tough times and membership was on the decline. He said, we're going to figure out how to do this. And I said, okay. Well, being Gastonia on this day. So I went and we had some meetings and did some things. And then walking out, I'll never forget this, walking out that day, he put his arm around me and said, you need to get involved in leadership, you know. And here I stand 10, 11 years later as president of this honorable organization. Um, one story George and I always shared, you know, I love this organization too. And we were sitting around talking at a, one of our beach trips or something, and we both shared the same story. I, friends of mine, my personal friends that aren't in the industry, my neighbors, and I get fired up when it's meeting time or we're going to the, you know, go, what? What, what is this deal? You know, I said, well, we've watched each other's families grow up together. We've, you know, but I said, bottom line, it's the people that are going to be at my funeral. And I look at this today, and George said, you know, that's right. That's right. And uh, I just thank everyone to track down here to Greenville, both family and friends, to honor George tonight. Um, the one time we got George, and you never got George very often. But when I was second vice president, second vice president's in charge of membership development. And that year we, we go to Raleigh and we have a, text, a small textile show in Raleigh and, and George came and STA had a booth so we were gonna do some recruiting. George, George stayed at that booth the entire week and we recruited 35 members. And that's a, that's a big jump for us. And he stood out front of that booth and Lillian would have the credit card thing and. George knows, he knows everybody in the world, and they come by, you remember STA? Nope, okay, well you're gonna be right now. <laughs> and, and the nice thing about that is, uh, 
their members, they joined, got involved. It wasn't just like, you know, give us your $90, you know. So a few of us got together and said, you know, we got to really, you know, we should reward somebody for who raises, who gets the most members every year. So a few of us come up and said, well, what are we going to call this award? And there was never a doubt what we were going to call the award. They come to the George Abbott Award. And uh, I think it's on display over there tonight. It is. And I also have one in my house. And it's one of my most prized awards that I've got in my long story history in the textile business. But it sits on my mantle. And uh, I started to bring it tonight. And I thought, no, I'll leave. Maybe I'm not going to leave. So, uh, but we got George. So, you know, the first one, we, we give to George the first year. Uh, I'm sure he raised the most members that year anyway, so it didn't matter, but we, uh, we kept it from him and surprised him with it at our annual meeting, and he was pretty close to speechless, but you saw part of that in the video. Uh, you know, I could stand here and tell stories for hours about George Abbott and what he meant, mean, means and meant to our organization, but he will live forever in STA. and. Uh, I just thank you guys for sharing him with us. Because, uh, yeah, it's about work and it was about industry, but STA and our, you see husbands and wives and kids here, STA was, was our family that we got to share George with. And, yep, if you've never ridden with George, you've missed something. <laughs> uh, thank you for allowing me to speak. Our condolences, it's, it's a big hole in all of our hearts. And I, I can't imagine the hole that's in y'all's, but. He's up there laughing because he's, he's, him and Preston probably teed it up today. So, you know, and, uh, but I'm sure he would love this event. Someone a while ago said, you know, we really should just do this about once a year. We'll all just kick in and pay for it. But uh, he, would, he would be thrilled that, that family and work and STA all came together tonight. So God bless you all, and thank you for sharing George with us. Thank you, Rick and Norman. Thank y'all. So now it's uh, time. If any of you guys would like to share anything, uh, you're welcome to. Uh, please don't think you have to, but at the same time, please don't think we don't want to hear from you. So, Cheryl, do we have some microphones? So you guys don't have to come up here. Make it a little easier. We have our two roving reporters. And if anybody, of course, you can come up here. Bobby, come on up. You're welcome to come up here. We'll raise your hand. We've got some microphones. We'll let uh, Bobby Howard coach, uh, former coach, Columbus High School Baseball. Thank you. Well, first of all, I'd say it's a great honor to be here and to uh, share a few mem memories excuse me, of uh, my relationship with George, with Bonnie, with Al, and David. And uh, when I got there in Columbus High School in 1984, but the summer of 83 was the first time I met George. and. Uh, it was very, you know, it was very impressed, you know, when I met him and he was just said, you come with a reputation of being tough. He says, all I got to say is just one thing, don't kill him and I'll back you all the way, you know, and he did. He was a buffer for uh, me and the parents and uh, I never seen a guy that was as charismatic and uh, being able to communicate with, with anybody and, uh, you know, he went like Al said, you know, he could connect with anybody in, along those lines and if you don't know anything about our club, uh, we won the state championship that year, but we made it to the state finals at the highest classification and pitched two back-to-back no-hitters in the finals. I don't think that's ever been replicated before. So, uh, but George was always the main person there, and you know, Al was playing baseball in college, and David was our shortstop on that team, and it was a great ball club, as you can tell. And but he would be a psychoanalyst, motivator, whatever. He knew the kids would, we could, I could have been absent, and they would all want to know where George was too. And Al, I think, alluded to that, and I hate to be picking back on some of the stuff he said, but it was so true, though, because, you know, he knew who needed aspirin. We had one kid on the team that was kind of, like, that, you know, I'm sure it was placebo or whatever, but, you know, he didn't, it was just a psychological thing, but George knew who, needed a batting glove or needed pine tar, needed eye black, it didn't matter, new shoes. We had a first baseman on that team that uh, 
we couldn't find any shoes for him. And uh, so I think it was 15 or 16, and our uh, secretary to, uh, ran our treasury department was Sue Ann Bolter at the time. And uh, Jeff was a great player for me back there. His mom uh, would always complain and, uh, because he didn't pay for his shoes. Anyway, this first baseman happened to be Frank Thomas, by the way, who's a Hall of Famer at Chicago White Sox. <laughs> and, uh, and George said, so just relax. He said, we'll buy him a new pair every week if he can have it. <laughs> and that's true, he did. And, you know, but the main thing is, is that our parents, you know, George would almost uh, not only give them homework, but he, we had attendance like we never had before. And it was just his uh, gift of connection and being able to motivate our parents. They would come, we'd raise more money than we ever had, and George made the, uh, Statement one time I said, What are you going to do with all this money? And then about two weeks later, we didn't have any money. And he said, Can you believe I said that? I can't believe I said that. But whether it be a new machine, whether it be, you know, it, it didn't matter what we uh, needed or wanted at a particular time. George was always resourceful and he went out and, and made sure it happened. And like I said, David was a great player. Al had left. He was an outstanding athlete, too. But me and Bonnie, we would go out and eat from time to time those three years. Even though we didn't have a bush, he was only there for one year, he kept supporting our program for the next two or three years through 86. And uh, and I never forget Bonnie would say, George, will you tell Bobby you love him? And Bobby, will you tell George? Because we, it was about 11 o'clock, we still take, we're still talking baseball. And that was such a passion of his. And one of his dream and vision was always to own a minor league baseball team. So we were kindred spirits in that, in that respect. And, and getting back to his competitiveness, a lot of people don't know this, but George got me into running right. He was running road races at a particular time, and he was in great shape. And he says, you need to come out and run. So I did, and then uh, out of the blue, after we run run three or four that summer, he said, you know, we need to do a triathlon. And I said, what? <laughs> he said, we need to do a triathlon. So we went and bought a bike together, and we trained, and we did a triathlon together. And, and I've been doing it since, but I owe that to George, though, and his competitiveness. And, uh, and I think a lot of that, like uh, one of the guys said, he wasn't just passionate about textiles, about baseball, about football. He was really, and that's, that's one of the most accurate things I've heard tonight, is that he was passionate about life. If he did something, like I said, whether it was a road race, whether it was baseball, and a triathlon, and you know, he said, we can do it. And I said, George, you're crazy. <laughs> so we went and bought a bike, but anyway, we did them, and, uh, and all of that to it, I really do. But uh, I just want to say it's, it's, it's an honor to, to uh, get up here. And, uh, and I know like y'all have the George Avenue Award, but it was decades later that every time I'd have to have a Booster Club president, and they say, well, I'm no George Abbott, but I'll try. <laughs> so, you know, and, 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 yeah, that was the thing. That was just a legacy that he left in, in that little small time in Columbus, Georgia, in our baseball program. And, and I want to thank David for being such an outstanding player for us that year and being so competitive. And then Al, and, you know, and, and Bonnie, they were just, they were just a close-knit family for my family. And uh, I don't know how to say thank you enough, but it's an honor for me to be here. But we had a great club that year, and it was a magical year that, you know, we just devastated people. I mean, that, that team just kept getting better every week and every week. And it was a lot to do with George's leadership and that uh, they knew, our kids knew, that it didn't matter what we wanted or what we needed. They could go to him and, and you know, and he'd write a check for it. And, and it, was, it was a blank check, and, and our kids responded. But it, it's an honor, and I want to say thank you. I love George. <laughs> Thank you. As you'll quickly determine, I'm not a very polished speaker, and uh, I'm going to speak very informally. Uh, first of all, I just have to say, have you ever seen anything so blatant as in the STA pictures of Devin Steele, Rick Carpenter, <laughs> And Scott Malcolm sucking up to George in those pictures. I, just, I couldn't get over it. Uh, George was one of my heroes uh, and one of my, one of my good friends. And uh, I thought of him in a lot of ways. One was as a, a, a fellow member of our manufacturing fraternity and sorority, I guess, that we have in textiles through the years. And what he did as, as a leader, and if, if, Al, your comments were very appropriate. When he was gone and working, the effort that he had to make through the years is, is, a, is quite an effort. Uh, I followed a few years behind him 
not many, but a few years behind him. And uh, when it's third shift on a Friday night, and you've got 25% of your workforce that's not there, you've got to be positive, and you've got to have that cup overflowing because you've got to convince people we can do it. We won't lose any results. We'll get it done. And so I appreciate very much that that mantra that he was able to maintain through the years. Uh, I was also saddened that uh, I found out after joining STA because, like Rick, I got a call and said, we want you in STA. I think you'll be a great leader. You need to be involved with this. And the first meeting that I went to, uh, there were 450 people that had had that same message. And I was far from alone. But it was quite a challenge, and he would look at you. And now the other thing, very briefly, that you touched on, that when he looked at you, he was talking to you and not to anyone else. And he was talking to a very special friend. And I always felt that. And to this day, I miss him. I've lost. Uh, I, this is another thing. I'm recruiting people because our golf team is severely challenged right now. Uh, I've lost two members this year, Preston Aldridge and George. And I don't need you to be talented because the only talented golfer we have on our team is Scott Malcolm. And so for the rest of us, anyone that wants to join, please send your resume and your party <laughs> resume, and I'll be glad to look it over and see if you make the cut for our team. Uh, again, the, the thing that paralleled many things was he worked for a great family business, uh, as I was able to do in my career with the Schufer family. Uh, he was a winner from the word go, and we'll miss him, I'll miss my friend. Thank you very much. Thank you. First of all, thank you for the invitation. Maybe you clarified something tonight. I wonder why George didn't initially like me. I went to Auburn. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, I, I work with the Bib Company, and George Junk and I joined the company at the same time. <clears throat> I was right out of college, and George was coming from uh, Dan River. And uh, we both worked some on the, and I worked in training, and George was getting orientated with uh, working some Bib. And uh, so they came to me after I'd been there two or three months and said, You're doing good. I said, How about? taking the third shift supervisor's job, to fill in, not, not take it, just try it. So I said, okay, I, I'm a little nervous to do that. But anyway, I went on the, the third shift, and then George was made night superintendent that same same day. So I get on, and I get in the spinning room, and talk. George came in and offers his assistance, and he said, I'm here to help you, bud. Just whatever you need, you come to me. And uh, so Spinner walked up to me. And she said, are you the college boy? <laughs> I said, yes, ma'am. She said, what are they training you up to be? I said, right now, I don't know. I'm just in training. And of course, George had a youthful look, and she turned around and said, son, what are they going to train you up to be? <laughs> George said, I'm the night superintendent. <laughs> but anyway, I had a... I spent 15 years with Bib. I left uh, a little before George did, but uh, we had a good relationship. Uh, I worked for him at the pain plant, and I was, he made me the youngest uh, department manager, I think, at the time that Bib had ever had. And uh, we got in and hadn't been on, on the jobs very long. George had to go once a month to a meeting at the corporate headquarters, and he came in one day, and I could tell he was frustrated. He told Hazel, the secretary, said, get all the plant, all the department managers, we need to talk in my office. So we show up, and uh, George said, I'm going to lay it on the line, guys. We got, we were turning out about 150 to 175,000 pounds a week in sales yarn. And, uh, he said, we got to uh, double our production. We got to reach 300,000. Well, we, no way. <laughs> 
So George said, I'm telling you that. It's not a threat from me. But said, they're going to close the doors if we can't reach that. Yeah, Texas had gotten, that was the start of getting tough at the tough times. He said, I'm telling that because you don't have to stay with the program, guys, if you don't want to. You can turn in your badges today. But I got confidence in, in, in this team that you're going to do, do that 300000 before the month's out. Well, we did. We started and we made our goal. But in the <coughs> middle of this, I was in the Air National Guard. And they had an implant audit every month. But this was a quarterly audit that they did at BIB. And uh, we were in a manager's meeting, and George said, uh, I want this audit done as close to as possible to uh, perfect. And I said, well, George, I got one problem. I said, I got to go to guard this weekend. He said, can you get out of it? And I said, possibly. But I said, I got a pretty tough colonel, commander. I said, he asked me if I'd call. I said, well, why don't you call? <laughs> <laughs> so George, got, I gave him the number. George dialed, got Colonel Smith on the phone. And, I was only hearing one side of the conference. We were in a manager's meeting. He was doing this in front of everybody. And so I could see George's face turning red. And uh, then he started, yes, sir, no, sir, which it wasn't usual for George to be doing that to anybody. <coughs> so then all of a sudden I heard him give the address of the plant. And they finally ended the conversation. And I think George said, he'll be there. So when he got off the phone, I said, I take it it didn't go too well. He said, no, you be at guard. I said, what was he wanting to know about the address of the plant? He said, well, in the state of Georgia, they can send the state patrol out here to pick you up. <laughs> I said, they can also incorporate you. <laughs> anyway, his leadership, the, the, the name Terrific George Fitz. And uh, I had many wonderful we. We started and worked together for 15 years, but we remained friends for 53 years. And I'll, I'll miss him, still do. Cheryl, your video was perfect, and I made some of that yarn and went into those sheets. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, we, uh, I thank you for the opportunity. And this has been such a nice event, even meeting some of the textual people. I've been out of textbooks for 20 something years, I guess, but I, I miss it. <laughs> Good. notes but I'm not going to I'm not going to do it because there's a lot of people who need to say stuff the only thing I'm going to say is I have driven actually I've ridden in George's car it was a uh, an ACC tournament about 10 years ago I was living in Charlotte George was living in uh, uh, Greenville so he was like okay the ACC tournament is in Greensboro I'm going to come pick you up. And I said, okay, let's do it. George comes riding up in there in a canary yellow Camaro. And I was like, George, is that your car? No, no mine's in the shop. I rented this. <laughs> and it was all good because I had never ridden in his car before <laughs> until I got on the road with George. <laughs> and I swear, you know all that construction that was going on in Salisbury, Greensboro? He was flying through that. I was like, George, man, you're going to get a ticket. I don't care, man. We got there in one piece, so I was happy about that. <laughs> the only other thing I'm gonna, on my notes that I wanted to say was that uh, George, every time I saw him, he had dinner with me and my wife here in Greenville at least once a year, twice a year. You the best word man I know. I said, well, you know, yeah, that's what I do. I'm a journalist. But no, man, you the best word man I know. I want you to do my eulogy at my funeral. I said, well, how's that going to happen? Because you always tell me you're going to live to be 107 years old. <laughs> and I'm not going to be here when you die. And... I said, okay, all right, I agreed. I, so I'm not doing his eulogy right now. <laughs> I did that in my blog that I think many of you read. <laughs> but 
he was such a special, special man. And just to keep it short, I've had several people ask me if I would do the song that I did at SDA for 20 years. And so, if you'll indulge me. I see trees of green, red roses too. I see them blue for me and you. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world. I see skies of blue. Clouds of white, the bright blessed day, the dark sacred night, and I think to myself, what a wonderful world. The colors of the rainbow, so pretty in the sky. Are also on the faces of people going by. I see friends shaking hands, saying, How do you do? They're really saying, I love you. I hear babies cry. I watch them grow. They're loving much more. And I'll never know when I think to myself What a wonderful world Yes, I think to myself What a wonderful world Everybody's best friend, George Abbott. Thank you. Hell, I gotta follow that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my name is Thomas Poston. I have. Uh, I'm in the textile business, but before I got into the textile business, I was actually in the carpet business. Spent many a good years down at Columbus. Georgia Collin with the Swift family and carpet mills and, and Getch's house and so forth. I transitioned to the uh, carpet or to the textile business in 2006. So I'm at a trade show, and this man comes up and he's just hugging me like in no bar. I'm his best friend. Who the hell is this? <laughs> and I said, I look at him. I said, I, I'm sorry. He said, Charles. Charles. I said, No, no. I'm I'm not. I'm I'm Thomas. I have a twin brother, Charles. That's my twin brother. We're in the back drinking. <laughs> but he had no idea. And to look at his face was so dejected, but also so optimistic that, gosh, a man may have fooled myself, but man, I get to meet another friend. <laughs> and we were good friends from there, and he obviously recruited me to the uh, Southern Textile Association. If you don't know what the STA is, that is a Southern Textile Association, and, and uh, you know George was a standard bearer in, in that organization. So anyway, every time that I would always uh, see him at a trade show or STA meeting, he would always say, "Man, I remember I came up to you, I put my arm around you, and you had no idea who I was." So I said, but George, I know who you are now, and that's what's important. So. Thank you guys for doing this. This is really special. Appreciate it. Well, I'm the I'm the twin. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny.
somebody calls me. I had a dinner with George right after Thanksgiving, and, and he came up to me and said, you remember where we met? I'm like, George, yes. Every time I see you, you say, remember where we met? We met in Germany, in Munich, Opera House. I was a member of the uh, uh, 2IA, Texas Yard Association. He said, ah, screw that. You got to join STA. Probably the best thing I ever did. Best thing I ever did. So uh, we, we were there. We had a great group. Our whole company was there. George and, and a bunch of guys on the back wall. Devin was there. So I, I come back and, and I, I, yes, exactly. And so we're, I joined STA. I go see George. George, I want to come see you. Try to say something. Yeah, come on. And I remember I went up and, and we talked and then we went to, to lunch. Thankfully, I drove, so I never got the experience of uh, George driving. You're lucky. Yeah, but we, we, we got through eating lunch, and he said, let's flip for it. Let's flip for what? Let's flip for who's going to pay. And I said, George, I'm, I'm taking you to there. No, that takes all the fun out of it. <laughs> flip for who pays. But he told me one thing. He said, because you may not want to hear this, but he said, when I wake up in the morning, I want to go to work. I hope something goes wrong. I said, George, what are you talking about? He said, I hope something goes wrong overnight. I said, why is it? Because I can dig into it and find out exactly what happened. We can correct it and we can go forward. And I knew then. And I told him. I said, George. And George is, you know, I'm a young guy, and I was, I was I used to be, but George was, I said, George, here's a, here's, a, here's a situation. I work because I have to. You work because you want to. And he loved the industry so much that I think in his last years, he, he loved everybody. I mean, you would see him at the trade shows or whatnot. And I said this last week at STA, me. I said, you know, when everybody, when you go to this thing next Saturday night, when someone says, how you doing? I always just say, I'm terrific. Because I remember George going to all the uh, summer outings, whether it's Myrtle Beach or if it's uh, Hilton Head. I'd go in there, George with his Hawaiian shirt. He was, he was welcoming everybody. Everybody would be trying to get upstairs to go up there. George was sitting out there. He had already checked in in that shirt right there. And he was he was the, the one person, the first person that everybody would see. And that will be missed. So God bless George. God bless the family. Y'all y'all hurt. We are too. But just know that the industry loved it. Okay? God bless you. Thank you. So my name is Mike Strader, and I have a distinct presence here tonight to my second funeral of our service today. So my emotions are all. Uh, I don't know about you all, um, but when I first got asked to be a part of SDA's leadership, Bill Kristarkin, who I worked for at the time, was the owner of Party Arms, he said, Mike, uh, Harold Edwards, who some of you know, is retiring, and George wants somebody from this company to represent FAR at SDA. He said, Mike, I want you to do it, but here's what you got to do. Don't disappoint George. George is going, going to uh, come to me, and, and I'm, I'm going to get that pressure to get somebody else. So I had that hanging over my head. And then I've been part of SDA since the days I was at the parking lot. So I, I knew this organization. And I didn't know until later that George was actually a uh, had actually gone to NC State. So for all of my NC State family in here, da 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 da
part that did that, right? But anyway, um, there is a, some people say, why do, you, why do you like the textile industry? It's because of people like George. I, my challenge to you is this. George has left us with a legacy. A legacy of, it's not a politically correct thing to say it anymore, but I'm going to say it. He's a legacy of a man. The right thing to say is Bill Parson. And he's lived that. And, and there's so many stories from the, from the Chapman family, who, who is real known in the industry, to Gwaltney's, to, to uh, Hollingsworth, to Milliken, uh, to all those names in the industry um, that, that were iconic. He was iconic. I'm going to close with this thought. I said this earlier today. What a blessing God gives us that shared in the life of each other. When I was a ninth grader, and I was, uh, I was a member of Scouting, and I come to have my salvation through Scouting, through my Scoutmaster, and I remember looking up at the sky and pondering the, the, how minuscule I was to life. And I have a teacher in the ninth grade, his name was Mr. Cameron, who said this was when teachers could say things like this. He said, you know, God's presence is, is vast. It's huge. He tried to make us understand. He said, you see that football field out there? That's God's presence. That's his whole universe. And the human existence is one blade of grass in the end zone, the far end zone, just before you go out of bounds. And in that one blade of grass, there's another football field full of grass that's our existence. So you start to think, with that smallness, how, is my time up? <laughs> um, how fortunate it is that all this motion of molecules and everything in his presence that we get to be here today, that we get to be part of each other's lives. That's part of what we talk about uh, in Rudyard Kipling's book, um, uh, The Jungle Book, there's a strength in the pack, is the wolf. And the strength in the wolf is it's the pack. pack. That meant a lot to me <laughs> over the years. And this man was a member of the pack, and he added strength and for one time and for George go pack go pack <laughs>
try to live up to what George Abbott was to all of us. And I hope we remember that day in and day out because I intend to. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Hello, my name is uh, Jim Buderbaugh, and um, I've known George pretty much my entire career in the textile industry. When uh, I was very young in the textile industry, I was working at the uh, Institute of Textile Technology. I was 25 years old, George was at Inman Mills, and, uh, and I would give reports on, on various research that we did. and. We even went to Inman Mills and did some projects. And, uh, and the encouragement from George helped me through my whole career. He, um, he said, you know, for being so young, you're pretty damn smart. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then every time that I talked to him and met him through my whole career, up until the last time uh, I saw him in December, he said, he said, Boo, I just appreciate how smart you are. <laughs> but, you know, just like Bill said, I'm not the only one that, that was special. But he had such a great knack of encouraging all of us to do better and to appreciate ourselves. And he lifted up our self-esteem in a way that um, we couldn't fail. And... Uh, I had the uh, uh, opportunity to work very closely with George in, uh, in the mid-2000s, 2005 to 2007, and STA's membership had been cut in half, and it looked like STA wasn't going to make it. And he, he, uh, he called and he said, Boot, he said, uh, we're going to turn this thing around. And he, said, and he called a meeting. And he brought in uh, Bob Barnhart from NC State, and he brought all, a bunch of people together, and he said, uh, he said, we're going to do things different in this organization. And we changed the way we did meetings, and we all, he also encouraged everybody to go out and get a friend to join the organization. And that organization, within a matter of five years, turned around completely due to George. And the, and the, the irony in the whole thing is reflecting on that, George would, would oftentimes say to me, Boot, you were so important in turning around this, in, 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 this organization. Yeah. And I'm going, George, what are you thinking? It was you. It, but, but it wasn't. To him, it was those other people that listened to him yeah. and took his encouragement and ran with it. And, and he just got so much joy out of seeing everybody that he loved and he worked with lift up and perform and and that's what i love about george so um there's a poem that i want to read and i hope i can get through this but um i, I read this poem also um when my dad passed but but it speaks so much of george and that's why i, I wanted to read this uh, it's uh entitled to those i love and those who love me when I am gone, release me. Let me go. I have so many things to see and do. You mustn't tie yourself to me with tears. Be happy that we had so many years. I gave you my love. You can only guess how much I gave you in happiness. I thank you for the love you have shown, but now it's time I travel alone. So grieve a while for me. If grieve you must, then let your grief be comforted by trust. It's only for a while that we must part. So bless the memories within your heart. I won't be far away if life goes on. So if you need me, call, and I will come. Though you can't see or touch me, I'll be there. And if you listen with your heart, you'll hear all of my love around you soft and clear. And then when you must come this way alone, I'll greet you with a smile and welcome you home. God bless you, George. We love you. Thank you.
information to all. We've got all the conferences all over the U.S. with him. And Al, you were spot on. We asked David, oh, David, David, where's your dad? <laughs> and we love Mr. George. He gave the best hugs, the best advice. And he made you feel like you were the only person in the room. And we were missing him terribly. And David, he was so incredibly proud of you. Thank you. you guys that had something to say we really appreciate it thank you this time we're going to let autumn come up autumn is the granddaughter in the family we've got all this male this in our family and uh, autumn is the female in the group the so the, the, yes the first grandchild so uh here's autumn George driving, but when I was 15, um, we were going back from Columbus to Macon. I was going back to my mom, so he was like, you know, Autumn, why don't you drive? You've got your learning permit. So I said, okay. Um, Big George drove really nice cars by that time. I'm not sure if it was a Lexus or what, but um, if you've ever ridden with him, you know, like, his cars drive very well. So I'm going on the back roads from <coughs> Columbus to Macon, and I'm just rocking out and he's in the passenger seat and he's just, you know, we're just cruising and he leans over and he says, hey baby, I say yes sir. He said, um, you might want to slow down a little bit. And I said, why? And he said, well look at the speedometer. And um, it was on up there, it wasn't, it wasn't in the hundreds, but it was close. And he said, you're going to have me go to jail. <laughs> I said, all right, I'll slow down. So I don't know what y'all are complaining about. I mean, he drove just fine. So. Um, when I sat down to write this tribute, the question that kept coming to my mind was, what is the measure of a man? And uh, according to Samuel Johnson, the true measure of a man is how he treats someone who can do him absolutely no good. And I cannot count the number of times that I saw my grandfather go out of his way to compliment a stranger, um, ask them how they were doing, or just say hello and smile. Most of these people he probably never saw again. 
but he still took the time to try and brighten their day. Martin Luther King Jr. said that the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. George Abbott faced every challenge head on and with a positive attitude, professionally or otherwise. I remember him telling me countless times um, how proud he was of his team at Inman Mills for thriving when doing so in the textile industry was not easy. Um, it was near impossible, actually. Or when membership numbers in the STA had dropped and he was striving to raise them. Um, he, never lost faith, he never lost faith that everything would turn out well. He never despaired, but instead he chose to see the best in those around him in every situation that he was in, as many of you have shared with your stories. Um, Robert South said, if there be any truer measure of a man than by what he does, it must be by what he gives. And Big George was one of the most generous people I have ever known, not only by donating financially to countless charities um, that he was involved with and people in need, but with his time. He spent countless hours reading books, going on trips, playing games, um, going to amusement parks that he did not always enjoy, like Disney in the summer and uh, just spending quality time with my cousins and I, um, and then later my son. He never missed a family vacation, and he never turned down a chance to hang out with a friend, especially if golf was involved. So what is the measure of a man? It is all of these things and more. George Abbott was a loving family man and a great friend. He never missed an opportunity to try to make someone feel good about themselves and to encourage them. He was a hard worker who put his all into his job and his work family. He meant so many things to so many people. George Abbott was a source of light in this world and it falls to us, those who knew and loved him, to remember what he was to us and to follow his example of positivity. I know for me that would be reminding myself each and every day that no matter what is going on in my life, I can choose to be terrific. Thank you. I'm David, uh, George's youngest son. I'm the chicken man. <laughs> I, I, I had a whole lot to say, but um, as Al and I talked, uh, he told me that going last has its privileges. Uh, it also has its setbacks. Uh, tonight it's a lot of setbacks because everything's been said. Um, I do want to say this because Autumn didn't give quite justice to, to what she said, and I can't believe she took my, my opening here. But um, the speed demon lives in my dog. <laughs> so if you get to a point where you think you want to feel that again, just call me and I'll let you go on a trip with her, okay? <laughs> um, another thing when we were talking about competitiveness and all of that, and uh, my coach told a story about the um, triathlon. You gotta know one more thing involved in this one. Uh, there was a guy, and some of you know him, Bob Harris, that worked at, uh, what was it, Fieldcrest Mills back in the 70s and the 80s, and one of his sons, his oldest son was my age, we went to school together. My dad and Bob went out and they went on like a bike ride or a run or whatever and Bob kicked his butt, okay? And my dad got home and he said, man, I can't believe this happened. I just got, you know, run over by this guy on the bike. And he went and found my coach and said, we're going to train. <laughs> so they began to train and train and train and they did this small trial. <coughs> uh, he got in the water. I thought he was going to drown there. I went with him. He, he made it out of the water. And then whatever order it was, you do the bike and the run and all of that. But when it was over with, he had won. And he won in his age group. He didn't only beat Bob, he beat everybody. And Bob got out of the, the bike or whichever one was in. And I thought, okay, they'd come over here and talk. That didn't happen. Bob went to his car and left. And my dad felt victorious because he was a competitive person. He liked to win. Um, we got that you. <laughs> yeah, we did. And a, a couple, I want to tell just a couple little things here, and then I, I want to share something else. Um, when my daughter was two or three years old, we were uh, trying to pick out the carpet for the restaurant. And, you know, Al and I had gone back for a long time with what we liked and what we needed and what we wanted to do. And um, 
I had my daughter at the restaurant this day, and my dad was in the office, and he had all these different carpet uh, pieces out there to choose what we wanted, and Al wanted one, and I wanted another, and all of that, and Autumn walked in, and, and Big George, to her and to us, said, uh, well, what do you like, Autumn? And she pointed to one, and decision was made. Uh, so his grandchildren were very, very important to him. Um, one more thing, y'all talk about golf, and now I know why. Uh, he loved to play golf with me, especially uh, I came up here and lived for a little bit uh, after we got out of the steakhouse because I didn't know what direction I wanted to go. And I, I just thought he enjoyed playing golf with me, but I think it's because he could beat me. <laughs> so, I, you know, I got to the point where, okay, now I know why. I, I did want to just share one thing, and all of this has been said, but I had a passion for playing baseball. Um, the reason I had a passion outside of just the love of the game is because my dad loved baseball. And I could see how proud my dad was when I played baseball. And by the time I was six years old, someone would come up and, you know, who are you or whatnot. It was, my name's David Abbott, and I'm a baseball player. Or in school, you know, everybody wants to be a doctor or something like that. What do you want to do? I want to play pro baseball. And this was from the age of six to I got done playing college. I played all the way through. So, you know, we worked in the restaurant and, and some other things that I was trying to do. And... Uh, he was trying to encourage me to figure out what I was going to do next. And, you know, we went on the golf course that day, and he said, Son, I can appreciate you wanting to find something to do, but now you got to get a job because I'm not going to take care of you anymore. <laughs> I said, All right, all right, I, I go. So I went down and um, got one of my friends I played softball with, played church softball with. He's over there. His name's Danny. And he and I got involved in this up and coming restaurant chain called Zaxby's. And that was in 1999. We did it together for a few years, and man, we were killing it. We were helping change the direction of what was going on in the operation. Uh, we were very involved, uh, and my dad, I talked to him a lot because he loves business, and I'm talking to him about all of this, and he could feel the energy that I had. And my dad was a passionate man, we've said that, but he was passionate about us, and he was passionate about my brother and I, moving forward and having a direction so when he could hear all that in my voice he came to me and we talked about it one day and he said you know what son we need to do this together 